just turn it up. And when she's ready, we'll just have a little slideshow about feathers and she'll play the prelude. Sorry, I thought we were done with the slideshow. Sorry. <laughs> Good morning, the Vashon Island Unitarian Fellowship. My name is Sylvia Paja. I'm a little hoarse today, but at least I can talk. Last week I couldn't. And I'll be your service leader today. Our community is supported by our minister, Victoria Poling, strengthened and enriched by volunteer contributions of our members and friends. Am I doing okay? Yes. <laughs> Human connection and relationships are important parts of our community. We invite you to stay for conversation following the end of the service. For those of you who are new here, welcome. I'm looking to see. As we settle in, we're finding the balance of being and listening, sharing and singing. Let's find our voice by repeating after me. If you are on Zoom, you can unmute yourself. It is good. It is good. It is good to be here. It is good to be here with you. For those on Zoom, you can now mute yourself again. <laughs> Important values we hold close are openness to all, individual freedom of belief, diversity, and social justice. We seek to promote a sense of community meant to enrich our spirits. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever your beliefs, whomever you love, know that you are welcome here. Oops, my shadow. <laughs> As a result of the Treaty of the Shanam Nom, Medicine Creek, 1854, the land was taken and the Squabash were forcibly removed from this island. They were relocated onto neighboring reservations, including Puyallup, Nisqually, Squaxin, and the Muckleshoot. This island paradise had long been used for gathering berries, foods, medicinal plants, hunting, fishing, and for ceremonial potlatch gatherings. Tribes lost their rightful connection 
to the place the Creator had entrusted to them. We recognize that this land acknowledgement is one small step toward true allyship with Native people and especially the Puyallup tribes. We commit to uplifting the voices, experiences, and histories of the indigenous people of this land. We seek to move beyond this land acknowledgement to true reparations and await the day when we will actively participate in such. So we meet in a hybrid fashion. Well, some of us are here at Lewis Hall in person. Others of our members of our beloved community are here with us on Zoom. Those on Zoom can reach out directly to Catherine if you have any technical issues. And our technical support is being provided by Catherine. <laughs> Thank you. And we are honored to enjoy the music of Kat Eggleston. We thank each person who has contributed to this service. Each of us is lifted by up by your contribution. As a member, as a reminder, the service is being recorded and posted on our website, but we will pause the recording during joys and concerns. The Transforming Mystery and Wonder team, <laughs> which includes Beth and Donna, Jeff, who's in Mexico, and Amy, who's not here, and I, we have worked to create this service this morning to share with you. Donna's going to do our chalice lighting and reading. Feathers have been have many different meanings, but they have always been associated with freedom, transcendence, and communication with spiritual realms. I would like you to join me in a feather meditation. Mm -hmm. If you feel comfortable, close your eyes. And as you breathe in, feel the wind under your wings, lifting you up. As you breathe out, feel the strength of the feathers in your wings and tail. As you soar, Feel the warmth of the down against your body. Now, change the angle of your wing feathers and glide downward. Follow a falling feather as it slowly finds its way toward a lake. Rest in this weightlessness of the feather as it floats on the still water. As you open your eyes, open your mind and heart and be fully present. And now Kat will play a little more musical interlude. Mm -hmm.
As a symbol across many cultures, feathers have always represented a connection to the spiritual realms and to divinity. And because of their connection to birds, they've always been a symbol of flight and freedom, not just physically, but also in a mental and spiritual sense. Like a bird that soars through the boundless sky and has a view of all things from high above. Feathers symbolize the ability to transcend and move beyond mental barriers and limitations, to see the larger picture and understand what really matters. They represent the freedom of your mind and your heart. This is a topic where the science of feathers awakens our mystery and wonder. Their magic lies in their magnificent beauty. Yet the science of how feathers are structured, how they allow for flight, how they create the markings of birds, is so exquisite that it moves us into mystery and wonder. Then we open to what feathers symbolize in different cultures and what they represent for some in the spiritual realm. Something so small and so weightless carries large and powerful significance. Imagine. Beth is going to start out our, our thoughts about feathers. Hanging from the cast iron chandelier over my dining room table are various odd ornaments that I've collected. Tiny Japanese paper lanterns, red glass balls, an origami of two cranes surrounded by two bees, and two small white rocks with spotted feathers strung to them, giving the impression of flying rocks. I spend hours at that table, and I find myself staring at the winged rocks, moved by their delicacy, and their beauty, and their humor. Feathers fascinate me, not only for their remarkable beauty, but also for their phenomenal power to set birds flying in the sky. How can something so small, so light, be so powerful? This contradiction delights me, small, light, and powerful. I'm left thinking about small acts of service and the power in such deeds, or a quick call to someone home ill and the big impact it can have on another. Small, indeed, can be big and powerful. Did you know that the weight of feathers in some birds is larger than the weight of their skeletons? Here's another one. Hummingbirds carry or wear 940 feathers, and whistling swans wear 25,000 feathers. The larger the bird, the more feathers needed to survive. Feathers not only provide the significant means for birds to fly, they also provide the necessary insulation to keep their bodies warm. We wear clothes. Birds wear feathers. Just as we are constantly losing and growing our skin, our hair, and our nails, birds molt, losing all of their feathers progressively over the course of a year. I love the concept of molting. Change is happening all of the time to birds' bodies. Nothing is stagnant. Nothing remains the same reminding me of Buddhist writings that focus on impermanence. I may not be molting, but I certainly experience change in my body. Not always easy for me, I can say. But I have found a deep appreciation for change and loss in my life that keeps me stimulated, engaged, and not stuck in a rut. 
are like feathers, will always be molting. My work is acceptance. Have you ever considered the metaphorical ways that you are molting? Feathers have several functions for birds. Flight for sure, insulation, yes, and defense. They protect birds from predators through camouflage and then courtship. Yes, those beautiful male birds show off their clothes to lure sweet young things their way. I've always wondered why it is male birds that have all the colors and flash, while it is we women who get to wear the fancy colors and fancy clothes. <laughs> Interesting contrast. Finally, feathers provide waterproofing for birds, allowing them not only to swim and move on the water, but also to protect them from the rain. When looked at as a whole, this is a remarkable list of necessary functions of feathers for birds to thrive. If there's only one just just one part of our body, our anatomy, that could, buy, could provide so many critical functions for us to live and thrive. I suppose it's our brain. Feathers, truly amazing and avian functions. Feathers have long held significance for their symbolism over the centuries with different cultural groups. For North American Indians, they signify the connection between the creator the owner of a found feather, and the bird from which the feather, the, bird, the feather came. It has never occurred to me to be open to nor consider the experience of being closer to the creator as well as to the bird whose feather I have found in the ground. Such a tender intimacy in this experience that in the past has been pretty commonplace for me. I recently picked, reached down to pick up a feather and noticed my disappointment to discover it was a leaf. <laughs> Next time, I hope to pay more attention to its potential meaning for me and, uh, and accept as I accept the deeper translation of finding a feather. I invite each of you to do the same. Allow yourself to feel the connection to the creator as well as to the bird whose feather you have found. Take a moment to conjure the image of a native leader in full regalia, feathers on his headdress. They symbolize high honor, power, wisdom, trust, and strength, all from something so small and so light. What a phenomenal contrast between the physical and the symbolic. I know no object in our culture that carries so much significance. Another example of their religious importance can be found under the Medici family during the 13th to 16th century Europe, whose symbol of three feathers represented faith, hope, and charity. From the 6th to the 19th century, quills were the primary writing instrument in the Western world. The best quills, in case you're interested, are from geese, swans, and turkeys. They were used to write the majority of medieval manuscripts, as well as the Magna Carta and her own Declaration of Independence. Imagine that. Our Declaration of Independence was written by a bird's feather. I love it. President, President Thomas Jefferson bred geese specifically at Monticello to supply his tremendous need for quills. The Spanish word for pen or feather or quill is la pluma, and our study of feathers is plumology. From a very different perspective, feathers were used in both world wars. Admiral Charles Fitzgerald was a strong advocate of conscription in his hometown of Folkestone, South Carolina, during World War I. Listen to this. He invited the women of his town to hand a white feather to men they passed who were not in uniform, shaming them into signing up for military service. This became known as the White Feather Brigade or the Order, Order of the White Feather. Fitzgerald believed that using women to do this would be most effective in strengthening the signups. The same strategy was brought back into World War II as well. Imagine that. 
using women to shame men into going to war with a small white feather. So different from our from the Native American shoes of feathers, symbolizing honor and wisdom and trust. Sometime after the war, pacifists found alternative explanations for the white feather as a symbol of peace. Take, for instance, the apocryphal story of the Quakers, who in 1775 were meeting in eastern New York when faced with a warring tribe of Indians. It is written that the Indian chief, upon entering the meeting house, found no weapons and a silent group of Quakers. Surprised, he declared them as friends. As he left the building, he placed a white feather from his quiver on the door, a sign to leave the building unharmed. Mm. If we considered the words hanging above us, each provocative and inviting to create a sacred space here in Lewis Hall, our team decided to hang feathers with the words. Do you wonder the meaning? Will you pause to consider the sacred in each of these feathers? Will you try to figure out what birds they represent or instead allow yourself to ponder honor, wisdom, and strength in each? I'm deeply moved by the huge scope of meaning that feathers have held over the centuries in so many cultures. May we never lose sight of the teachings of the feather. So much about the science of feathers creates mystery and wonder for me. The writer Elliot Holt invites us to experience the intimacy of attention. I love this phrase, intimacy of attention. To me, this means to focus carefully on the mystery around me. And then to think about what I am observing can become intimate for me. How this kind of attention broadens and deepens my spiritual reflective self, how it influences my being and how I am in the world. Feathers have become a metaphor for me. The science invites me to think of the meaning they may have in my life. What lessons can I draw from feathers? First, I'm awed that feathers are dead structures. Like the hair on our heads, they are a mass of dead protein pushed out from a follicle in the bird's living skin. They're composed of keratin, a lightweight but tough material, just like our fingernails. Because feathers are dead structures, a feather that is damaged cannot, be repair, cannot repair itself and doesn't get replaced until the bird molts. What is incredible to me is that it is a dead structure that enables the Arctic tern to migrate from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back 25,000 miles. I get inspiration from this strength of feathers, their durability, the distances, they pump the air and propel the bird forward. They remind me that there is a tremendous reservoir of strength inside of me if I am willing to trust it and call on it. Feathers are incredibly light. Feathers account for 15 to 20% of the total weight of the bird. Now an Arctic tern weighs 3.9 ounces. <laughs> that means that the feathers of the Arctic tern weigh only three quarters of an ounce. Just think. 
These are what provide the airfoil of the wing and deliver the forward thrust as these birds migrate their 25,000 miles. Feathers have a hollow shaft, which is incredibly strong. These hollow shafts are actually stronger than solid shafts of the same weight and provide the strength and durability that supports the Arctic Tern's long journey. I think I have something to learn about how lightness can be coupled with power, endurance, how we humans don't have to be big in our lives to live with strength and commitment, that we can quietly, lightly be powerful forces. How being light and open with space around my thoughts and opinion can bring me into a willingness to accept new ideas and new wisdom. Feathers provide, as Beth said, birds in many ways, protection, waterproofing, insulation, camouflage, communication, display. Each bird has six different types of feathers and each has a different function. One of these contour feathers cover the body and the major wing and tail feathers. Contour feathers actually have barbs that interlock with each other so the birds have a kind of feather skin that is waterproof. And this is where preening comes in. The preen glands contain oils that help waterproof the bird's feathers. And when a bird preens, it removes dirt and parasites and arranges these barbs into neat rows to form the airproof surfaces essential for their flight. I am reminded of Elliot Holt's phrase, intimacy of attention. I want to recognize how I can provide my own waterproofing. How does the science of feathers inform my being and how I am in the world? Can I let things go like water off a duck's back <laughs> when there is an unhealthy temptation to react quickly, respond with my own opinion? Can I imagine myself with a feather skin, one of interlocking feathers that is not hard and resistant, not held in a fixed position? The science of the coloration of birds is also part of my wonder. Birds produce gray, black, and brown pigments, but the red, pink, yellow, and orange are produced from the food that they eat and the way the light works with the structure of their feathers. All of this science leads me to want to stop and look more carefully around me in appreciation and in the intimacy of attention to be more in the present moment to be in wonder at the things around me. Ed Young writes in his book, An Immense World, about the umwelt concept, <clears throat> how every animal exists in its own unique perceptual world. We humans sense only a fraction of all there is to sense. Every animal exists in its own perceptual world. The sights, sounds, and textures that it can sense but that other species may not. Jung writes that the umwelt concept is the animal's sliver of reality. A tick's umwelt is limited to the touch of hair, the odor that emanates from skin, and the heat of warm blood. A human's umwelt is far wider, but doesn't include the electric field that sharks and platypuses are privy to the infrared radiation that rattlesnakes and vampire bats track, or the ultraviolet light that most sighted animals can see. Birds, by the way, can see ultraviolet light. They have an extra gland, one more than humans, in their retina, and they can see ultraviolet light. I took a note down today. I just want to refer to it. Um, they see ultraviolet light, but they are also much better than humans at detecting differences between similar colors. A vole, vole urine reflects UV light. 
So kestrels soaring above can plainly see their trail. And that's why you see these birds drop on their prey. It's, it's amazing. Birds can see ultraviolet light, but what else do we know about their umwelt? I want to move from my human umwelt to a curiosity about how animals around me perceive what gifts of perception they have that help them navigate their lives. I think would wonder at the Arctic turn unwelt. How do they know to arrange those barbs on their feathers? as they preen and ready for flight. What are their perceptions of feathers as they form the airfoil and they take off for their migratory flight? This is all part of the intimacy of attention, that kind of observing that creates wonder. And for me, this is all part of lessons from a feather. Mm I never wanted to fly high to the bottom of the way you said you'd come. I thought it was your way of talking, but you said you do some wings. You found out how it would be done, but I was done. I never thought you'd be You were so clever and I had watched you for hours. With a blue and the rubber band, the feathers and the lace and flowers, and a fish wing, they grow so bright. Like some bird of glory, I began to envy you a sight, like some old Hello, uh, my name is Alex Clark, and I'm here to read Amy's oops, me, piece for this. Lessons from Feathers. My interest in birds and their feathers began with my now deceased husband, Alan, as he designed and launched the Enjoyment of Birds class for Vashon Audubon at the Land Trust Building between 2008 and 2010. His focus was on backyard birds, including the American Robin, Anna's Hummingbird, and the Dark-Eyed Junco. 
But he didn't just show, show a photo of a dark-eyed junco. He showed photos of it in all seasons, with feathers all fluffed up in the winter on a snowy branch, hopping on the ground in spring, foraging for food in summer, and singing from a red alder leaf branch in the fall. Alan was inspired to create passion in his students for identifying birds. So he returned to the juncos again, showing the difference in their breeding versus winter plumage, and explaining how birds molt or change their entire plumage nearly every year. He taught that due to wear and fading, birds typically molt innermost primary feathers first, then work outward. But molting is energetically expensive, like breeding and migration. Because of this, birds molt in between two other activities, which for most North American songbirds is July and August. Yet consider tree swallows, he urged, which begin molting on Vashon, then pause for migration south, where they complete it in their wintering destination. Other birds, like the American goldfinch, molt over winter from dull olive green to vibrant yellow and black by early summer. Then he showed photos of eagles and pelicans. Alan taught that they molt over multiple years, restoring individual primaries and secondaries on their wings in a staggering manner. These lessons from my husband still resonate with me, giving me a desire to look closely at a feather I find on the side of the road. Is it recently molted? Which feather is it, primary or secondary? What in me needs to release? And what new beginning will regrow? These are similar questions that artist Chris Maynard of Olympia, Washington asked in his Feather Folio, in his 2014 book, Feathers, Form and Function. If we try, quote, if we try to engage the whole world at once, details become a blur, Maynard says. Each bird sports an array of feathers that are incredibly diverse. The downy body plumes, the stiff black quills that are cupped and curved. Some of these feathers act as thermostats, expanding for insulation, then contracting and squeezing out pockets of heat when temperatures get too warm. The in flightless birds, like penguins, the veins of the outer feathers act as a waterproof barrier for the fluff trapped below. Maynard writes in his blog, feathers are born out of function and strength. They keep the animal cloaked, sheltered, and attractive, and they sustain it in flight. They cross oceans and mountains, reaching altitudes and distances impossible to imagine. And Amy writes, yet beyond my imagination of those incredible journeys, I feel a deeper, more profound, and spiritual connection to Mother Nature herself. My heart swells with gratitude over her gift of the beauty of a full moon, reflecting on Puget Sound, orange and red clouds during sunrise, rain and water to bathe in and to drink, air to breathe, and habitat for the feathers I marvel over. We are blessed to learn these profound lessons about and from feathers. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, I think it's good.
So uh, we have a, I have a slide to go along with my piece. And um, I just, when we, when our team comes up with a, 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 an idea or a thought or a theme or something for our, um, for our services, we, we just brainstorm. And it's just a really exciting time. It's almost like a stream of consciousness. So you come up with an idea like feathers. <coughs> and we start talking about feathers. And Donna's um, thing that she, that she found was the intimacy of attention perfect with what we do. We just bring our intention to whatever this whole concept is and see how we can find something deeper in it. So we thought, you know, we think, talked about feathers, their lightness, their beauty, their delicate and possible strength, the miraculous science behind their structure, the birds that wear them, their symbolism, meaning, metaphors. And for me, what came to mind were angels. <laughs> Again, it's sort of almost a stream of consciousness, why angels? But I remember when I was a kid, I had a small frame picture of a guardian angel, this one right here. And I imagined those two little kids on the, on the uh, rickety bridge as my brother, Andy, and me. And through the years, you know, I found the same picture on a coffee mug, on a t-shirt. And then recently I found this little one of it at <laughs> Mike Urban's estate sale on the counter or whatever that. You know, they could you mother know, they Anyway, so it's something that occurs. So, and as I was reading about feathers, I found this uh, saying that says, feathers appear when angels are near. <laughs> and I realized that that means that the feathers represent a connection to the spiritual realm. And that finding a feather is a sign or a message from the divine. And whether you believe in angels or spirits or messages from the universe or messages from a loved one that's passed on, feathers are seen as carriers of the message that they wish us to receive. So I listened to the message. I realize we have to listen to the message. We have to read the signs. We have to look for guidance, whether it's in a feather, an expression on someone's face, a feeling of deja vu, a tarot card, a coincidence or synchronicity, a recurring image, a dream, a poem, a stone, a leaf, or a puddle that is in the shape of a heart. I took a picture of one in a parking lot one time. <laughs> and that bigger message that this small feather is teaching me is to listen, and not just to your little brain, which is the tip of this iceberg of information, right? But listen to the emotions and the instincts and the intuitions and your gut and your heart and your senses. And that's from the um, bottom of that big iceberg of information that's under the water, the subconscious. And there's a poem that Mary Oliver wrote called Angel. And she says, you might see an angel anytime and anywhere. Of course, you have to open your eyes to a second level but it's not really hard. That second level of looking for the deeper meaning in small objects and everyday experiences creates a real depth in our lives, a richness. I thought about it's like going from black and white TV to technicolor. You know, it, it just blossoms our lives. And it's funny, that's what I found when I, one day I walked out the front door with a cup of coffee in my hand, and I walked down to the Havara, where the Vashon Island Unitarian Fellowship was meeting. And I walk into this room, and it's full of these people, all kinds of people, that have actually made time in their busy lives to come together and to connect and be with each other on a deeper level. And whether or not they believed in angels, right? <laughs> and that's why I'm here. So I'd like to read one more poem by Mary Oliver. 
I refused to live locked in the orderly house of reason and proof. Mm -hmm. The world I live in and believe in is wider than that. And anyway, what's wrong with maybe? <laughs> you wouldn't believe what once or twice I have seen. I will just tell you this. Only if there are angels in your head will you ever possibly see one. Mm -hmm. Can we have a little bit more music and talk? Let's take a moment in silence and listen to the music uh, and uh, reflect on what we've shared. time to share joys and concerns of our members and friends, honoring the common humanity and the sacred spirit within each of us. We support each other in difficult times and celebrate our joys together. If you have a joy you'd like to share or a burden that might be eased in sharing it with, with your community here, you're invited to come up and light a candle. And you're also welcome to light a silent candle. And if you're online and you'd like to share a joy or concern, please put it in the chat and Catherine will share it for us. Mm -hmm. We believe that joys and concerns are prayers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unitarian Fellowship, we commit to supporting our congregation. Financial resources help us pay speakers and staff and to maintain our building lease. Our congregation also engages beyond our walls for peace, social and economic justice, freedom of belief, and protection of the planet and its inhabitants. Once a month, we contribute our financial offering to a community organization that aligns with our values. Today, we are contributing our offering to our own beloved community. Please support VIUF with your pledges and offerings so that we can continue to be a vital community. I invite the greeters to come up and pass the baskets. And as we pass the baskets, we can sing, we give thanks. Nope. Thank you. 
When a feather falls to the earth, it is believed to carry all of the bird's energy, and it is perceived as a gift from the sky, the sea, and the trees. Feathers may arrive unexpectedly, but not without a purpose. Mm Well, I think we'll have a post lead for cats. And if you can play the feathers like you again, that'd be great. Thank you. Another Irish tune called the Peacock Feathers. <laughs> 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 I was supposed to ring the chime now. <laughs> <laughs> this concludes our service, and now is the time for announcements. If you have an announcement to make about events sponsored by the fellowship, please come forward and use the mic so everyone can hear. And we'll call on the people in Lewis Hall first, and then our uh, online announcements, if anybody has one as well. 